What? Oh my god, it sounds it smells so good. <laughs> I'm gonna be barbecuing for the first time this season uh, tomorrow night. I make some steaks. I've oh, got to nice. get all the dead sticks from pruning that tree out of my backyard before the whole place just goes up. Yeah. Not safe. Yeah, I technically barbecue under a, like, is a veranda the word? Or, like, an... Gazebo? No, I guess not a veranda. Yeah, kind of like a veranda attached to the side of my head. It's more like, like a, a porch. Um, mm. And, yeah, you can't step away from it because it could yeah. theoretically catch the roof on fire. You've got, uh, have you got gas or charcoal? Propane, yeah, gas. Yeah, I've got a charcoal one, so just literally lighting a fire in my backyard and hoping it doesn't go poorly. Yeah, I like charcoal. It just takes a little while to yeah. get started. Like that's the nice thing about propane. Like if I'm cooking burgers, especially I've got like a a Weber grill. It's pretty good. I have it on and ready and done in like ten minutes. Yeah. I I hate having to wait for the heating up, especially because it gets so smoky with charcoal and I'm in a smaller area where my backyard is like one square foot yeah. going to mm -hmm. the neighbor's houses. But either way, hello there, everyone, and welcome to Tap Calf Transmissions for episode 66. We are going to be talking about episode three of Star Wars, Revenge of the Sith. There's something that happens in here, which is actually kind of related to the number 66. We'll see if you guys can pick up on it. Uh, I'm your host for the day, Corey, joined, as always, by my Jedi Youngling co-host, Mr. Eckhart Slatter. How are you doing, Justin? Uh, I'm slightly older than you, Corey, so... I like a week. Yeah. That's a real so Jaina are... move right there. <laughs> so are you a Youngling, too, then? Yeah, we're all Younglings. I mean, we're all I'm getting... A... The voice just cracked, so... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I dude, I someone should do a voice crack count for like I guarantee I'll have probably two this episode. I don't know what it is. Like I think it's just like puberty when you t well, I guess. I mean, if I wouldn't complain about growing another like 6 inches or whatever, but um I don't know. I think it's just like when you talk on like a podcast or a stream, it's like you're projecting your voice. So you yeah. Can, yeah. Well, your stream your stream voice is very noticeably different from your regular talking voice whereas mine is usually a lot more in line with how I normally sound unless I do something like this. Um mm -hmm. where I, I just want to make my voice sound as deep as possible. Mhm. Mm and it's going to go really low. <laughs> Exarkun, that's my normal voice. Exarkun. <laughs> All right. Uh, Swedish, uh, my dad is calling me. Uh, so we're going to have to postpone the pot. No. So anything you want to talk about before we get into episode three's novelization by Matthew Stover here? Any news you want to cover? Mm, there's not a whole lot. I mean, I'm excited for Bad Batch tomorrow. Um, we've got that. I guess we could talk briefly about that range of the New Republic thing where it's like. So, I, or no, we actually talked about that last episode, I think, a bit, didn't we? Yeah. Yeah. That was one yeah. of the. Either one of the questions, or we talked about it at the start, mm -hmm. uh, what it means to be not currently in production. But yeah, I don't know. There's not. It's been pretty quiet. I'm like I'm more in a Halo mood right now when it comes to news because we're getting a Halo Infinite reveal pretty soon and within a couple yeah. weeks. So I'm excited about that. Um, I'm sure we'll do something about that. Maybe not on the podcast, but maybe on the podcast. Who knows? I think we end up uploading one of our past ones, didn't we? Uh, yeah, one of the ones from, was it the Squadrons reveal or was it the Halo stuff? Because those were the two kind of gaming news podcasts we did. Mm, I, I can't remember, to be honest. It might have been Squadrons. Yeah, that might end up being more of an X2 podcast thing, but, uh, mm -hmm. but yeah, so we aren't going to be talking about Bad Batch this week. That'll be our episode for next week. Next Friday, we'll cover episodes uh, five and six of the Bad Batch. And we probably won't be covering a book next week. I'm going to be super busy preparing for the 15th anniversary of Thrawn's Revenge. So I'm uh, I'm shirking all other obligations next week and hiding in a hole until I have all that stuff finished. Do you but want to talk about that 15 year anniversary, what you guys are doing and whatnot? Uh, yeah. So for those who may not be familiar, I've run a mod for a Star Wars game, Empire at War, for 15 years now. And so we've got a whole celebratory stream coming up next Saturday where me and a bunch of the other devs are going to be showing off some new stuff, uh, just talking about the random crap we've done in the last 15 years, kind of like fake virtual con style. Uh, mm -hmm. Since every con's online now, I thought it would be fun to structure something slightly like that. But, mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, 
Anything big coming up in your world? No, I can't. I can't think of anything. Uh, we we've launched the new X Two podcast. So if you guys are fans of this one, you may be fans of that. It's not similar in any real way. If you like the parts of this podcast where we stop talking about Star Wars and talk about irrelevant Canadiana, that's what that podcast is more of the time. <laughs> yeah, just with like more drinking usually. Um, I'm yeah, you can check right that now, out. Apparently, so maybe not. Oh, nice, nice, beautiful. I'm saving mine. I'm. Sa- I feel like I might may end up having to chug a lot of beers tonight, so I'm yeah. I'm hydrating. I'm I want to <laughs> drink three of these before, but before I go to sleep tonight. But uh, but yeah, not not too much else for me. Um, yeah, yeah. So let's get right into episode three mm-hmm. of Star Wars. So uh, have have you seen this movie before? Or read this book before? Or was this your first time? I have done both. Okay. Um, episode three is one of my favorite ones to just throw on. Um, episode yeah. three and a new hope are the ones that I throw on the most. Um, but I did watch it again for the podcast. Of course, I watched all the deleted scenes as well, because a lot of them kind of get translated into this novel. And I've read the book probably three times before. Mm-hmm. How about you? I'm mostly in the same boat. Uh, I didn't rewatch the movie yesterday or today. I intended to, but then I just didn't have time. Uh, so I, I think I'm pretty familiar with what happens, so uh, I think I'll be in good shape. But There's uh, nothing in the movie that's not the novelization. <laughs> yeah, and then longer. Well, that's actually not true. Not true, because the it's kids getting murdered isn't, kids, yeah, doesn't show that's up. That's the one thing I noticed. Uh, which I was really surprised by, but because uh, I, I thought it had. It was like a George Lucas regretted that decision or something. Yeah, but maybe. I don't know. But, uh, but yeah, so... This is a book that is, I think, pretty well loved. Like it, it's pretty, mm-hmm. it's held in pretty high regard in the fandom, uh, and it is by Matthew Stover, who also wrote Traitor in the New Jedi Order and Shatterpoint in the Clone Wars. Did he write anything else? I don't think so. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't think. Well, he's so. he's written other stuff, but uh, I, I mean, Star Wars. Was. Yeah, I was I was thinking before that it was that he wrote Dark Lord, but that was James Luceno. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I, I don't think he's written a whole lot else in Star Wars, but he's got a very different style than anything we've read um, mm-hmm. up to this point. And that's the big thing about this book is it's written like an epic almost. Um, he did write Shadows like... of Mindor, actually. So that's oh, I always forget oh, right, about that. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, this book is written kind of like a, like a, an opera or an epic or, and like a lot of people pointed out that Revenge of the Sith is basically like this giant ballet or, Mm -hmm. you know, so for a lot of people that will work. And I definitely really like parts of it, but there's also other parts where like it goes a little too far. Um, we were talking about how like the early section on the invisible hand is, is really, really long. Um, so I think how well or how much you enjoy that kind of stuff will determine how much you like this book. It does add a lot. I think for me, the weakest point is the dialogue that's added. And the, yeah. the best point is kind of the ideas that are added. Like there's a lot more explanation and rationale provided. And usually that's good. Sometimes it's not. And we'll talk about that. But that'd be my basic, uh, basic two paragraph opinion. Yeah, like I really like the extra context and characterization that gets added. I do agree that some of the dialogue that gets added in, like any exchange, any quick exchange in the movie gets mm-hmm. turned into a much bigger thing here. Uh, mm-hmm. Sometimes losing out on some of the specifics from the movie. Uh, and sometimes that's done in ways that I think detracts from what's going on. But uh, mm-hmm. overall, I really like this. And I I do think the first... 50 to 75 pages has a lot of extraneous stuff because the time it takes them to get into the invisible hand in the movie, which is what two minutes, the whole, yeah, that is 40 to 50 pages in this Mm. book. Uh, A lot of it's kind of cool, but like one of the weird things, it's like, there's so much extra action. So like mm -hmm. a good example too, would be the grievous fight where like in the movie, he just throws the, giant block down on the droids in the in the movie he d- brings the droids through a big chase and he brings them up to the ceiling and it's all pretty crazy yeah like i feel like for most of the book it works really well if it had just been trimmed down a bit at the start and there is mm-hmm. a lot of stuff that is helpful at the start like uh explaining who the characters are not just like oh this is 
uh, Anakin Skywalker and this is Obi-Wan, but like actually who they are, what they're kind of mm -hmm. about. I think a lot of that does help. Sometimes it's done in a little bit of a heavy handed way because mm -hmm. uh, with a lot of the characters, especially in the early part, it kind of clears up a bit as you go through. But mm -hmm. there's uh, this is Anakin Skywalker, colon. And then two pages of kind of explaining his mental state at that time. And there's there's a lot of really cool elements to that. But in some places, it just feels like it could have been uh, a, a little bit done, just a little bit more integrated into the actual story. Because I feel like a lot of the stuff that is done does integrate into the story. And you don't necessarily need the whole mm -hmm. expositional expositional side of it. Yeah. Here's a really good example for like how wordy this book is. So like most Star Wars books will start with a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. This is how this one starts. This story happened a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. It is already over. Nothing can be done to change it than like an extra three paragraphs. And it's like you're saying more words there, but you're, you're not, not adding. necessarily adding anything. Yeah. Like, the stuff after that is about, it's a story of love and loss, brother and betrayal, courage, sacrifice, death of dreams, story blurred between best and worst, et cetera, et cetera. That part I liked, but it's just like, that one sentence there, there's a, a lot of individual instances of that throughout the book. Yeah. And especially just with that stuff happening so much more at the start, like, it, it does hit its groove later on, but I, mm -hmm. I can see this kind of putting off some people with how that starts off. Yeah, and I, I almost wonder whether, like, the book was originally going to be all written like that. And then they're like, calm the fuck down. This is going to be insane. Yeah. Because there is like after the, after the Dooku scene, it does change significantly for the better. Cause like, in my opinion, the Dooku fight is probably the worst part of the book. Yeah. And Dooku, the whole thing with Dooku and how he's presented, uh, I wasn't sure how I felt about that. Like a lot of the characters, I really feel like it kind of, explains in a reasonable way why they're acting the way they are and where they're coming from, which I think mm -hmm. is something that Stover is really good at. And that's why I love Traitor so much. Mm -hmm. But the uh, with Dooku in particular, he just comes across as a bit of an idiot. And maybe you kind of have to make him seem like an idiot for falling for the idea that like there was any intention that Palpatine had of keeping him alive. But mm -hmm. even the way it's presented there, like he has to be super dumb with how the book presents Palpatine's plan for Dooku to have thought that he would have been coming out alive. Mm -hmm. And he's not like, he's not a dumb character. He's not kind of the, he's not how he gets presented here. I don't think. Yeah. Dooku's also much more like Imperial here. Where he's like a xenophobe and human supremacist and stuff. I can and... see a lot of elements of that working. Yeah. But... No, I can't too. Cause he's very, he's sort of got that arrogant, side to him always yeah um but yeah it's 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 interesting i guess but like another good example of the wordiness is like instead of palpatine just say do it like he does in the movie he's like do it anakin you know it's the best thing to do like blah, blah, yeah blah, blah. loses but, out on that sort of cinematic quality yeah because like part of that is supposed to be there's this trusted figure telling anakin what to do in the spur of the in moment the and he does the moment it. yeah and then it's like Halfway through the fight, Palpatine's like, "Oh, if you get a, if you get his lightsaber, maybe you should cut his head off with that." Then Anakin, mm -hmm. "Oh, well, that would be cool." Once I get to that part of the fight, and then they keep going, and then five minutes later, he's on the floor. Like, oh, okay, now I'm gonna do this. But it's interesting because, in my opinion, um, I think Palpatine's probably the character who I like um, the most from this. Like, I, I think is most improved because. Yeah. I said this before, and it's kind of gross, but he's he he he's written like a pedophile. Yeah, like in the way that he tries to take advantage of, because like w like a lot of this book is, I mean, it's just like the movie. A lot of Revenge of the Sith is just he's small, grooming Anakin. Yeah, he's grooming Anakin. A bunch of little things happening, and this book really expands on that. Where like not only are all, the, all these little things happening, but like what Palpatine is doing is he's taking uh, like a bit of truth, like something that's got a hint of truth to it, like the Jedi are against the Chancellor, and he's using that to to lie to him. Um, yeah. And, yeah, so you get a lot of that grooming throughout the book, and then at the very end, uh, or not the very end, but kind of right before the May scene, it's like, he's at that final, like, that scene's kind of gross, almost, in the way that he's like, I'll give you anything you want, and like, he's basically just like, trying to break down these walls, and at this point, like, Anakin's beyond desperate, and he's 
you know yeah he's miserable and he just wants out of everything and it's just like it makes i think that's a really big improvement too. yeah mm -hmm. i think a lot of what we're going to talk tonight is going to come down to like what the jedi want from anakin what palpatine wants from anakin and how they're approaching that what their perspective mm -hmm. is coming into that but yeah. one of the things with dooku was the thing of like uh how he's upset with the corruption of the republic and uh and how everyone's just buying all their power but uh mm -hmm. then it's like oh well actually he uh he inherited his all this money and power uh so i, I just there's a bit of yeah. a juxtaposition there between yeah no i agree that that's a good point um it, it it is kind of weird too how much they spend on dooku when he is sort of a throwaway character in the end mm -hmm. um, not throwaway but he is thrown away early on and they move on to grievous um but like the interesting thing about the book and the, the movie really too is like the war is not even really a thing the war is just a backdrop like the clone wars is never really in like by the time dooku's killed and the Clone Wars is never in question. Like, you know, the Republic's going to win. Um, the book talks about it as if the Republic's on their back foot when the invasion of Coruscant happens, as if, like, they've been pushed up to Coruscant rather than this being, like, a desperate last move the CIS is able to just launch through uh, after being pushed to the other end themselves. I think that's a pretty big difference between how it got presented here yeah. versus how it got developed later. There's a lot of that, because keep in mind... Like people, this came, this book came out with the movie. So it's before the Clone Wars, before most of the established lore. So, like, for example, they mentioned at one point Darth Maul, but they mentioned Darth Maul as a character who's just killed in yeah. on Naboo, uh, which I, I thought that was kind animal. of funny. Yeah, that animal. And like, that character who was killed on Naboo then became a crime lord of the, <laughs> like, we fought 30 times. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's one Dooku. example. <laughs> yeah. Um, it was kind of kind of interesting to in that way to see like the differences between like what changed because of the Clone Wars and whatnot. Yeah, and there's a lot uh, that kind of shows uh, the Jedi mindset. And one of the things that does come up even in newer media of like the problem with the Jedi uh, in the conversation that Obi Wan has with Padme before they go to Mustafar, it was mm -hmm. like, oh, the Clone Wars was never the real conflict. Uh, it was a distraction. Mm -hmm. It's about the Jedi. And Padme says, like, oh, well, the all the people who are dead because of it, that probably seems like a real war to them. And, mm -hmm. like, obviously, Obi-Wan doesn't mean that, yeah. like, oh, the war never happened. But there's a lot of how the Jedi think about things. And this is evident in how they treat Anakin, where they kind of expect everyone to have their light versus dark mentality. And, mm -hmm. like, the big thing with what the Council is doing with Anakin is they're expecting him to come from the direction they are of putting the putting aside his own personal feelings, his own personal treatment by Palpatine and of by themselves to do their duty to the Order first. And that's never going to appeal to Anakin. That's never going to work for him. Yeah, because he's a person. Yeah. Like, yeah. He's a person, um, and his name is Anakin. Like, he, he covered yeah. this in episode one. And she's an angel. Um... Yeah, it, it's just kind of interesting, too, how, like, both Anakin and Palpatine are trying to manipulate him. Or, sorry, uh, both Palpatine and the, the Council are trying to manipulate. Now, you can say the Council's not trying to manipulate, but ultimately they are trying to get him to do something yeah. for their own goals. It's just Palpatine says it in a nice way. Palpatine yeah. says, tries to manipulate him and then says, I love you. And the Council's like, do this, and also we don't give a shit about your feelings. Well, so Palpatine... Palpatine is manipulating him. I don't think the Jedi are manipulating him so much as completely misreading him and not realizing that they could manipulate him if they actually tried to do that. Like, if they approach him the right way and understand why he does the thing he does, they could easily use Obi-Wan to actually manipulate him. Or probably not easily use Obi-Wan, but they could have been nicer to him. They could have tried to see things more from his perspective and try to understand what his worldview is and why that is what it is. But instead mm -hmm. they've taken his fear of losing his mother and turned that into uh, a reason not to trust him for 15 years. And rather than ever really come to terms with the fact that it, this is someone in their order who at some point they need to accept that they need to deal with him on his level in some way. Uh, they're just, they keep trying to force it through as if like, no, what you're doing is wrong. Also, you need to do this very important thing for us 
that goes against everything that you are and that we know you are, but we're not willing to compromise on that. Yeah, and Obi-Wan even points out points that out to Mace and Yoda, and they're just like, he's like, but Anakin's not like that because he he's because they're basically saying how Anakin should be a Jedi first. Yeah. And Obi-Wan's like, Anakin's not like that. Like he's fiercely loyal. And then Mace's response is, well, he should be like that. Like, yeah. Maybe, but he's not. Like, yeah. Like, like, what are you gonna do? Like, yeah, maybe he maybe he should be like that, but he's just not. So Yeah. And they're already taking advantage, like they're using the idea that he isn't like that already when they're asking him to do the spying on Palpatine, right? Like he wouldn't be in the position to be able to do that unless he was the kind of person he was. So they're kind of trying to have it both ways. And Yoda does kind of come to terms with that later himself. He's like, oh, I've been wrong for a thousand years. But yeah. And then what is it at the end of the book? That's the only hope of the Jedi Order. It's two children produced by yeah. humans through love it's like maybe if you didn't hadn't raised like ten thousand like celibate incels or vol cells whatever who like think that you shouldn't ever care about anything like maybe anakin would have been able to talk to somebody yeah and i really like the way that comes up in like in the clone wars cartoon even though it's not a huge topic we do kind of see some inkling of the fact that like had he gone to Obi-Wan earlier, maybe it would have ended up better. Mm-hmm. Cause like we know the relationship that Obi-Wan has. We get like a lot more indication of like, no, Obi-Wan knows what's going on. Like Yeah, he straight up says, yeah. Yeah, and Anakin could have gone to him. But at the same mm-hmm. time, as much as this could be put down to like, oh, this is a thing the Jedi Council does wrong, Anakin is still the person who went and slaughtered an entire Tuscan camp. Yeah. And like we get that with the whole uh, this dragon inside him metaphor for the entire book until the end when Anakin's like, no, it's only ever been me. Mm-hmm. And like, there is an element of the Jedi pushed him away and did everything they could really to make that become who he was, but it's still part of who he was. Yeah. That's actually one of the problems I sort of had with this um, book. Like, I think Anakin is supposed to be flawed. He's supposed to be arrogant. Um, I didn't like one issue that I had is they kind of took away any ego from him being a Jedi master, which is something that I think the movie suggests. Like, like the, the prime example of that is they kind of have this subplot where Anakin wants to become a master so he can get access to the Jedi library. And that's why he's so angry um, at yeah. the council because he, he wants to get into the that, Hogwarts restricted section. Yeah. And he thinks that there's a book there that will maybe save Padme. I prefer the idea that he's mad because he's a, 20 what 22 year old or 23 year old like like galactic hero who has an ego and yeah you know like he's basically like a, he's he's literally been called the chosen one his entire life yeah like that would give you an ego um so i think that that's kind of one thing that i didn't like and i think the book tries to do that a little bit too much i can't think of another example right off the top of my head right now but where they try to give extra nuance to something that doesn't necessarily need it. Mm -hmm. Um, Like it's, I think it would be perfectly fine to say that Anakin was this person that could have gone either way and had done these horrible things and had this as part of what he's naturally inclined to do. It like be very hot headed, be impulsive, uh, think of the world in very black and white terms of like who's loyal to him and who's not while still having some sort of nuance. And like, had the Jedi been a better support system, both now with Padme and with his mother earlier, maybe a lot of those things wouldn't happen. And had they not just pushed him away where he was going to go to the first person who's been nice to him, which is Palpatine, even if Palpatine was being nice to him in a manipulative way for his own purposes, he has no choice but to go to that person. Uh, And you can do that without making it seem like, oh, really, it's just because Anakin wants to save Padme. That's the only motivating factor. Yeah, like one thing that Palpatine actually touches on is that the Jedi have to get them as children because they want to have them brainwashed through this entire, like, brainwash the humanity out of them. Um, yeah. So, like, I think highlighting how that's a bad idea is something you can do without, like, and maintain some nuance, but also um, kind of highlight the fact that, yeah, Anakin's not perfect because it wasn't the Jedi that forced him to slaughter his mom. Yeah. Um, like, that could have happened while he was away on college, like, at college. <laughs> <laughs> well 
I do like that we get a lot more from like Obi Wan's side of understanding the Jedi perspective, but also knowing mm-hmm. where Anakin's coming from. And part of that is because they've done all these heroic things together that makes them the topic of pod chamber stink wars across the galaxy. <laughs> yeah, I have that in my notes. <laughs> I had that in my notes, but I was like, what does that mean? Now that you said it, I remember. I like my my note just says pod chamber stink wars. Like what the what the hell does that mean? <laughs> yeah, there's whether Obi-Wan's legendary cleverness might beat Anakin's raw power, straight up, no rules, is the subject of schoolyard fist fights, crush pool wriggle matches, <laughs> and pod chamber stink wars across the Republic. These struggles that always end somehow. Podcast. <laughs> the pod the pod chamber stink war? Podcast, yeah. Hmm. A lot of peace. <laughs> I think um, that's how it becomes a stink pod chamber stink war. What pee. did you um what did you think of another thing about the intro? They kind of uh go the route of oh what you see on the screen's not representative with like it says the ships are firing from hundreds of kilometers away but it looks like they're next to each other. What did you think of that? That was a super unnecessary caveat for it was uh, like curtis saxton wrote that section yeah well especially when there's only it's not a super space combat heavy book like the mechanics of space combat doesn't really matter to it and the one time it does is when uh nita is contacting grievous Mm -hmm. and i i did i turned that into a whole video because i have no shame uh but Part of Grievous's terms there is that at the end of the 10 minutes, Nita and uh, the other three ships need mm-hmm. to be 50 kilometers away, which does not coincide very well with what they're saying about mm-hmm. the rest of the space combat. Yeah, that's true. I didn't even pick up on so, that. Like, why, even, why even put that in if... But whatever. Yeah. No, I, I, get, I totally agree. Totally agree. Uh, let me just check my notes. There's a lot to talk about in this book. It's a, it, it feels like a very long book. Um, I did like the uh, the Shatterpoint stuff as well. We get like, again, this is early on in the EU compared to a lot of the Clone Wars stuff. So we miss out on a lot of stuff we'd get um, from, uh, you know, if, if they were to do it later. But we get references to some of the old Clone Wars comics and we get the uh, the Shatterpoint stuff. That was kind of kind of nice. Yeah, the like the references to Carrots and Dreadnoughts and yeah. uh, other characters and ships. Though we do get the weird, uh, the whole Geonosian Dreadnought thing as the mm. probable Lucre Hulk core ship. Lucre Hulk core, yeah. But that was a little odd. Because that's, that's caused some, some fandom fun over the years, I think. Yeah, there's like that image of, what's the the one that people always hold it up as? It's from... Republic Commando or something, I think. Oh, the, yeah, the uh, the Geonosian cruiser that's on Kashyyyk and somewhere else. Uh, but it's like it's a very small like ship. Raxus Prime or something. Yeah, I think yeah. there's one on Raxus Prime in uh, mm-hmm. then Force Unleashed. Yeah, yeah, uh, Force Unleashed. Yeah, I think so. And like, yeah, there were especially in Empire War mods a uh, a long time ago. It typically got used as the Geonosian dreadnought and was mm-hmm. made this huge thing. Uh, yeah. but like if you look at the size of the guns and the scale relative to because like it's right next to places that you go in the game so you have a mm-hmm. pretty decent basis for scale it can't be bigger than a carrick really yeah. and much less massive so one thing i want to talk about is the jedi have this plan to lure sidious out of hiding first of all they know that they think that sidious is in Palpatine's inner circle, but they don't think it's Palpatine only because he already has full control over the galaxy, which I thought was kind of funny. Yeah. Um, but the idea is to, first of all, they need to track General Grievous down, um, and they need to have Yoda leave um, Coruscant so um, cities will come out of hiding. So they send Obi-Wan after Grievous, of course, and then Yoda goes to Kashyyyk, but that's a huge mistake because Obi-Wan's like the only person who really knows Anakin like beyond yeah. like surface level Jedi bullshit. Yeah. They're so leaving they the sh- point of contact for Anakin as Mace fucking Windu. And that's it. Yeah. And it's funny because my note right under that, it says just want to tell Mace Windu to shut the fuck up. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> why not have Yoda 
go to Grievous. Like, I know you do lose out on the ability for Yoda to respond immediately. Utapau's probably further away than Kashyyyk, but still. It's kind of like two birds, one stone there. Yeah, it just it's so dangerous to have Anakin as this point of contact for Palpatine. Like, clearly he's put on the council as a spy there. Clearly he has more of a personal connection to Palpatine. They're not actually getting that much useful information out of him. Send Anakin after Grievous with Obi-Wan. Have him not be around. Yeah, and it's kind of funny because that's like the thing that gives Palpatine a lot of ammo because he's he makes up this elaborate ruse of the Jedi want to uh, kill him and, you know, take the Senate over. And like, it's a ruse, but the Jedi are giving him elements of truth. Mace Windu talks about removing senators and they are using Anakin against against him. And now yeah. they're right to do so. At least you could argue they're right. But Anakin can't see the full picture. So it's yeah. like they're just giving Palpatine ammunition to use against against the Jedi. Yeah. I mean, they've never also asked Anakin his uh, his political views, which uh, dude is just a straight up authoritarian all the time. Yeah. Uh, why this wasn't more of a warning sign for Padme is questionable. I think she kind of gets shafted a bit in this book uh, mm -hmm. as being like a one note character who only exists to love Anakin. Uh, and that's another thing that I actually do enjoy about the Clone Wars more. Uh, the cartoon is that it does give her a fair amount more agency in what she's doing. Mm -hmm. um, but like we get a few lines here that's uh, from like Bale in particular, where it's like, oh, Padme is more of a better politician than I could ever be. But mm -hmm. like a lot of what Padme does in this book is just tell people, eh, eh, no, no, shut up. Don't tell me anything. It's better if I don't yeah. know. Like, come on. Yeah. Um, I liked the and that's kind of funny because they could have made it a bigger thing. Like they could have focused more on the early rebel stuff. Mm. Uh, Cause that was even a deleted scene in the movie. We get a Garmba Liblis mention uh, in the book, which is nice. Um, but yeah, they could have definitely focused more on her there um, because yeah, she doesn't have much agency and her death is really, you know, she never kind of truly confronts what's going on until the very, very end. And uh, like, I know there was that, alternate scene or alternate idea for a scene where Padme has a knife and she confronts Anakin with that. That would have been interesting. Um, mm. The love that they have is kind of like, it's kind of juvenile. Um, yeah. Which is a problem that I kind of have reading it as an adult. Like it feels like they're high school crushes. Yeah. Whereas like when you're in a relationship with, with another adult and you're married, you don't see them as a perfect human being. Like you could still love them and want to be with them every moment of every day or whatever. But like the way that Anakin covets Padme and even vice versa is just not a realistic yeah. relationship for two adults. And maybe that's part of the point, like unhealthy attachment versus healthy attachment. But like that's something that could have been improved in the novel, I think. Yeah, like I feel like it works from Anakin's perspective because you can see how Anakin would get to a position where he's doing that and where he doesn't grow out of it. Cause he is mm -hmm. kind of acting the way that a lot of, uh, a lot of teenage boys end up acting. And yep. part of it is that he is so afraid to lose things that like people in his life, especially that like, that is a big part of what drives him in these, in the entire prequel trilogy. Uh, and it's true of Padme, but it's also true as his, of his relationship with Palpatine and Obi-Wan. Uh, it's just more intense with Padme, but there's never a point where uh, where Padme is either tempering that or where she's shown any differently, uh, except for like her being more cautious about the world knowing who are knowing about them. But mm -hmm. where you can see how Anakin would get from his upbringing, from losing his mom, and then joining the Jedi, losing Qui-Gon. Uh, like, you can see how he gets to where he is, but it, it does always feel a bit weirder with Padme that she goes along with it and that yeah. like she's, she's the she's, same she's way. She's approaching 30 or whatever. Like, she's... Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I agree. Especially because we do see in the Clone Wars when Anakin gets jealous over... What's his name? Um, Base, Papa John. Um, in the cartoon? Uh, the yeah. With the guy who turns out to be a separatist assassin or whatever. Yeah, and Anakin gets really jealous over him and uh, Rush Clovis. And um and 
Padme's like no for a while. Like 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 so she shows like a bit of kind of restraint there. Um So yeah. Yeah, there's even an extent in the book where it's like, "Ah, oh, but him acting like a child is what I really love." Mm. Like, yeah, that's cool when he's like leaving you love notes and stuff. Like a little less cool when like he can't handle like <laughs> basic shit about yeah. being an adult. <laughs> And like he just jumps to jealousy as soon as he finds out that Obi Wan's been there. Uh, mm -hmm. Then he finds out the uh, like the delegation was there because Obi Wan's allergic to the tea that he could smell, and Padme <laughs> doesn't like it. Uh, but there is that one deleted scene that is just explicitly in the movie, which was when that you were talking about, I think, where they're in Palpatine's office. Uh, Anakin's there. Yeah, and then Palpatine's like, "Oh, that Padme sure is a traitor, isn't she, Anakin?" <laughs> And it's like, no, it's not weird. <laughs> <laughs> I would have liked more of that kind of late stuff where it's like seeing the senators like get vanned. <laughs> yeah. Like taken off to wherever. Um, I liked the uh, I liked the line from Bail Organa where it's like, I'm going to do some shit and it's going to look like like I'm not epic anymore, but I still am. Yeah. <laughs> well, he gets arrested the least out of all the, the leaders. Mon Mothma kind of gets out there. He gets a whole bunch of worlds crushed with the yeah. secession worlds. Uh, mm -hmm. Garn Bliss always just goes and tells Palpatine to fuck off. But that's just that gets covered up by the whole Corelli. That's just Corellians. Yeah. And it it's very clearly or very nearly wasn't just Corellians because Anakin was going to own the Corellian system. Yeah, all five planets would have been pretty cool. But uh, yeah, that that was the that's the part where he's like trying to, if you haven't read the book, uh, listening, that's the part where he's trying to convince Palpatine basically, or An Palpatine trying to convince Anakin to join the dark side. And he's like, I've got a planet for you, I've got five planets for you, I've got a new speeder for you, whatever you want. And Anakin's like, Well, what do you need from me? And he's like, Nothing, just live your best life. <laughs> yeah, and like, I found that conversation kind of weird because it does undermine some of what he told Anakin already about like why actually this Darth Sidious guy could be pretty epic. Whereas mm -hmm. like the big thing for Anakin is like, oh, look how if only we had the power to stop the war and mm -hmm. Palpatine's like, uh, to I stop can the stop war, the would, war. <laughs> would tomorrow be too soon? It's like, does yeah. Anakin never question how Palpatine knows the Separatist leadership is on Mustafar. Mm -hmm. Like, wouldn't that be kind of a wait, wait a minute moment? I know Anakin yeah. is not getting any extra points in the intelligence department, but like, it, I think at that point it's like he's so far in. It's like yeah, the veil kind of is lifted a bit. By the time he goes to Mustafar, he is at least thinking like, oh, Palpatine's turning everyone against him. I'm gonna kill that guy. But he yeah. switches just so fast into I'm gonna murder everyone I care about. That that's it, still it one of the weird. biggest problems that the novel doesn't address and is even worse sometimes. Yeah. Um, like the way he talks about Obi-Wan, he's like, I hope Obi-Wan's dead. I hate Obi-Wan. Mm -hmm. Where like in the movie, it's like he hate, he is mad at Obi-Wan because Obi-Wan, the next time he sees him, he can, comes to kill him, basically. Um, yeah. And like thinking it like Anakin's whole thing is just being in the moment passionate rather than this calculated. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm going to kill this person and this person and this person. He's doing these things, but he's doing them because he thinks there's an end he's accomplishing that has more of a personal level to him. Like the statement from him that he's going to kill Palpatine, him and Padme are going to rule the galaxy after Palpatine unites everyone against him. This is a level of thinking that Anakin never really exhibits before with goals that aren't really in line with who Anakin is. Maybe in the abstract way they are, but he doesn't think in the abstract way. Like, mm -hmm. he's thinking beyond just he's going to be okay with Padme um, and Padme is going to live and the war will be over. He's thinking, like, Palpatine is this manipulator. I'm going to take advantage of that to unite the galaxy against him. Yeah. Like, it would be much simpler for him to say, like, like in the movie, he's just like, I'll just kill him, which is like, yeah, he's just responding because Padme is not responding well to what he's saying yeah basically yeah there's a clear impulse coming from padme there where there's an element of like anakin listening to the latest person he's talked to and however much they can appeal to whatever his emotional state is at the time that he just kind of flips off mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Um, yeah, and that's just kind of like when it comes to the book, that's just the weakness of over explaining some things, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Um. One thing I have in my notes is that Anakin didn't change for most of this book, so he's probably just when next time you're watching the movie, just think he's probably really greasy and he probably stinks. <laughs> That's all Jedi, though. Yeah. Use the Force to shower. What did you think about um, Obi Wan's Force scenes or his combat scenes, where it's like very different from Anakin? Obi Wan basically fully gives himself to the Force, and he's kind of described more as like an active observer than anything else. Yeah, I think that really that highlights the whole uh, Jedi versus Sith philosophy a lot more. And I, I mm -hmm. actually really like that presentation of Obi-Wan where they can make him be so powerful, but still in a kind of humble way where he's not really directly responsible for those accomplishments. He's uh, when the council is talking about who they're going to send against Grievous, he doesn't understand that they're talking about about him uh but yeah i i i do really like how obi-wan gets handled probably more than anyone in this book uh maybe with the exception of the extra depth it gives to palpatine mm -hmm. i didn't like it at first and then i thought about obi-wan in episode four where like he takes that let the force guide you thing to the full extent where he's like he lets vader kill him just because you know yeah. that's what the force tells him to do and like when it comes to blowing up the Death Star to Luke, he's literally like, let yourself go, like, make yourself a, like, the Force can do this, so. Yeah. Yeah, it is pretty consistent with, and like, that's that's part of the issue when, like, sometimes you get, like, the Force a little too video gamed with, like, hmm. literally video games like the Force Unleashed, but also other parts of the EU where it's, like, the Force is making you run super fast, or, like, the Force is making you shoot lightning, and, like, yeah, it can, but, like, yeah. it's more kind of, um, it's more holistic than that. A will acting through Obi Wan, and that's kind of what the Jedi are aiming for. Whereas the Sith mm -hmm. are kind of bending that to what they want to happen, mm -hmm. uh, which is part of how like the Sith can take advantage of something in the near in the shorter term, but over the longer term, uh, as long as the universe isn't being a dick, the Jedi might come out on top. But I yeah. did think there was some like some wry humor missing from Obi Wan. That mm -hmm. is more of a thing he has throughout all the movies. Like, mm -hmm. that's kind of always part of who he is. But here it gets kind of left out. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, yeah, we get a taste of it in like the Grievous fight. But other than that, yeah. Yeah. How, what did you think about? So part of the Grievous fight uh, at the end when he shoots him and then he says so uncivilized. The book makes it seem like he's talking yeah. about Grievous, but it, I thought it was pretty clear in the movie. It's, the like, blaster, it's about the blaster. Yeah. He's looking of the at whole... the blaster and throwing it away. Yeah. Yeah. That was dumb. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'm glad we're on the same page there. Um, Palpatine kind of suggests that the Jedi don't believe in democracy. And I mean, he's not really wrong, is he? No. They have their own self-appointed... Uh, self-appointed council and from the perspective of what he's trying to tell Anakin like oh all this power I've grabbed in myself uh, that well, that was democracy but Anakin mm. also Anakin doesn't give a fuck about democracy anyways so mm. I don't know that it's necessarily the best or a necessary line of thought to approach Anakin with this is the kind of thing that comes back up in Fate of the Jedi where it's like and in Legacy of the Force and in New Jedi Order where it's like Luke is goes from having a separate Jedi Order to putting his Jedi Order together with the government. And then later in Fate of the Jedi, he kind of extracts the order from the government, moves them off Coruscant because it's like, listen, we don't want to have to support everything the GA or the Republic or whatever does. Yeah. Like we're on the side of good and like a government is not always going to be good. Yeah. Especially a government written by George Lucas. Yeah, I think like the fair thing with what the Jedi are trying to do would be uh, removing themselves from being a tool uh, for the policy applications of the government, but they should still in some way be answerable to the galaxy. And that doesn't necessarily, I don't think the way that Palpatine had it set up where they were directly answerable to the, to the, like having them be an outreach of the PMO is not the best way to do it, but PMO. 
Yeah. Like, they're not supposed to be Justin Trudeau's goon squad, but yeah. they should at least have some sort of oversight. But it's also like, should they not be able to stop slavery on whatever planet because it's not in the Republic? You know what I mean? Like, yeah. That's a weird distinction to have where they're Jedi are supposed to be tools of light. Yeah. Um, there, there was something else that was kind of weird with, uh, with Anakin and what his perception of Order 66 is, where I don't know if he's just saying it for Padme's benefit, but after he shows up at her apartment and she's talking or he's saying like all the Jedi are required to surrender. Uh, like, does he really believe that's a thing they can do? Because if he does, then that undermines the fact that he'd be willing to go into the council chamber uh, and just slaughter a bunch of children for being yeah. too indoctrinated. But he's also trying to think like the uh, the other Jedi are allowed to surrender later. Like, which yeah, is and it? I think he's just using euphemism. Like, I don't think he actually believes it. he can't believe it after what he's done. Yeah, like he doesn't even give anybody a chance to surrender. Um. He's at the point where he's like trying to say whatever he can to convince Padme to stick around. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. It's something that I've always kind of struggled with with Anakin in episode three, where uh, I don't think that by the time he's full Vaderized that he's above doing this, but the depths to which he falls and the logic for it like how fast that happens. We know what he's willing to do to the Tuscan Raider camp, but we also know why he sees them as an other and as a threat. But he just goes overnight from thinking, oh, the Jedi Council is pushing me to do this thing for a Jedi attempt to overthrow the government to being willing to include all these kids in that, that just because they're part of the order, when he himself was part of the order, and he's still questioning, like, how much does Obi-Wan know about this? How much is he involved in it? And he kind of gets one over on the Obi-Wan thing, but Obi-Wan's directly part of the council. And, like, yeah, George put that scene in, so that's part of it. And Anakin wa marches on the temple. But, like, it just seems, I don't know. I don't know if we get enough justification from his perspective for him to do yeah, a I lot think of that's... what he does as fast as he does it. I think that's honestly just because. Revenge of the Sith is basically this like epic, like I've called it an opera or like, I, I don't really know how you could describe it, but it is basically this great story of like, it's exaggerated a lot. It's just kind of the way it is. Like it's, it's more about themes I think in this movie yeah. than anything else, which is probably why you see like a lot of the politics from the other movies. Some of them drops like, the the politics in this movie there it, there's a lot of politics but it's it's very simple Jedi yeah. versus Palpatine, whereas Episode One like I still don't quite understand what the Trade Federation was going for with tax yeah. disputes, um, like, yeah I just yeah there's a definite core to everything Star Wars is talking about with like this is how someone kind of falls to fascism or. Uh, authoritarianism or doing these kind of atrocities but i think uh it almost undermines the message it's trying to send in a way by having it be that sudden and that obvious mm -hmm. rather than kind of pointing out no this is a slope that he's been going down for 10 years and the influence of palpatine was part of it and just having it flip that switch it's like it's not going to be mm -hmm. that obvious yeah i guess the right word for how i feel about it is it's like it's it, this is like the most of a myth of a Star Wars story, yeah. if that makes sense. Um, where there is maybe you can't like logic your way exactly through 100% what Anakin does, but there's the idea that you know there's good people, and there's bad people. Um, this is what the government means, this is what you know people take advantage of you, all of these things. This is the type of person you should be. So, I, I think maybe that like you do kind of lose some detail and some explanation because like there's no easy way to just to have to have someone do something so horrendous and to have such a good person be so bad. Um, so yeah, yeah. I, it, it's always going to be really difficult to, to make that make sense. But I think if you don't, it's just, it's the story is not as good. If yeah. you don't have that jump. Cause it is like such a, it's like a tragedy. It's like a Shakespearean tragedy almost. Yeah, like, I guess what I'm saying is that the equivalent, the historical equivalent would have been like 
uh, some Nazis were kind of shit. Uh, but then it's only once they put on that armband that they really started doing the bad stuff as mm-hmm. if there wasn't. Yeah. Yeah. No, I know. What but, that makes sense. Uh, what else? I'm not sure if I have anything else in my notes other than some scanner equipment. Oh, yeah. So the whole thing of like being afraid of losing uh, Padme in childbirth, they're clearly not pursuing this as a legitimate concern because yeah. she hadn't been to any doctor's appointments and found out that she actually has twins. Like, yeah, anatomy is usually one of the one of the early things you check. <laughs> yeah. It's like, yeah, it's like maybe you're giving birth to a 30 pound baby and that's why you're going to die. Like, <laughs> yeah. Um. Just really not, really not handling that very well. So, what is, do you like the books? Uh, more kind of poetic or flowery sequences, like the parts at the very beginning, like the Age of Heroes stuff, and then there's the parts about the dark and the light. Did you like that? Those sections. I liked the the kind of dark and light stuff in the interim, like in the mm-hmm. parts between the sections. Mm-hmm. The Age of Heroes stuff. Eh. I felt yeah. like that went on. Yeah. I thought it was good. I thought if you could cut the beginning part, it'd be good. Fine. But I th- I really like the end. Like where because like the end kind of um, where is it? Let me pull my book up. The end kind of ties into this kind of feeling that the whole book has uh, where it's. Uh, though this is the end of the Age of Heroes, it has saved its best for last. So it is like, a you know, yeah. it's kind of mythical moment which is yeah the the book sometimes does a good job of highlighting that sometimes not but yeah yeah uh so what do you what's your before we get into the email questions unless there's anything else you want to talk about you want to get into rankings or yeah for me this was also i see some people in the chat asking does the republic not have maternity care they do because um Padme even says even people in the lower level on Coruscant don't die of childbirth. So yeah. maybe the droids know that they're twins. I don't yeah. Know. Did they just ask know. the droids like, oh, we don't want to know. Yeah. It's like, but you might want. No, no, don't tell us anything. It's like, My second crib. No, yeah, no. no. <laughs> uh, but yeah, for rankings, I don't know. For me, this is either a high A or a low S. Um, I don't know if it re. re-, re- really rises to like the Plagueis last command level. I can't remember what I ranked I Jedi. Um, I think I'll put this, I think I'll put this low S tier for me. I really liked it. Yeah, me too. I think uh, we got another S one. Oh, thank you, Matthew Stover. You have reached the very uh, exclusive list of S ranked authors on tap. Catherine. Most- That's an honor. Yeah. He it's may like, not be. He may be one of the only authors that ends up with um with multiple S tier books for me though. So that's interesting. That's exciting. Yeah. Uh, you don't have. You only have one. You don't think um we can get another Timothy Zahn S tier? Uh, I don't think any. Maybe outbound. I think you I had two Alphabet Squadrons in S. Uh, yeah, I might, but like it's it's going to be a very small list of authors that have that. Mm-hmm. So, so right now, I think we've got Freed, Zahn, um, Lucino, and then we've got we've got who else am I missing? It, Stackpole Do, might be there if one are, of us. Stackpole for I. Or, if one of us put I Jedi in S, I'm not. I don't know that we did, but. Uh, like I'm trying to think of what we have coming up for for Timothy Zahn that might end up in S tier. Like I was thinking one of the duology books for me. I don't know that or maybe, maybe gonna... Outbound Flight. Like I could see all of them ending up in like A, mm-hmm. but I don't know that they're quite gonna make it to. Yeah, so I'm not sure. And I feel like you're not at any real risk of putting any of the new canon ones that he's done in S. Like I don't think you're gonna put a Sanity book three in that in S tier. So. No, I'd like, I, I definitely really like, like the first Thrawn. part two. So I might put I might, I might I could see myself putting visions of the future in S, but mm. don't I get ahead of myself? Yeah, I remember really, really last time I read it with being really impressed. Uh, I can't remember my first impressions, but yeah. 
Okay. But, um, yeah, that's it for our rankings. I guess we do have a few questions, though. We really need to have some sort of actual place where those get recorded so that we can remember. I know. You say I'm going to do it. I will eventually. Hmm. So we have a few emails today. If you have any questions you'd like us to answer on the podcast, you can email tapcaftransmissions at gmail.com. That's tapcaf without an E. Uh, we did get a couple questions asking us about specific books and if or when we're going to do them. Uh, generally, the answer to any question of like, are you going to cover X? Uh, hopefully, we just don't know exactly when anything in particular is going to be covered. Yeah. Uh, so there was, yeah, there were a few, but we we will hopefully cover as much as possible until we get tired of each other. Mm -hmm. But yeah, do you have any of the emails open, or should I just start reading? Yep. Uh, but you know who's who's with the first? Uh, uh, Hans, it should be maybe? Hans first. Yep. I've started so Han, the ones again. Hans asked, "What is one planet in Legends or Canon you'd like to see more of?" Uh, I agree, a Coruscant and New Canon, which is what he said. Um, it's been kind of forgotten. I'd like to see a lot more of it. Yeah. Same. And that actually, that goes into our next question from Mark. So we can kind of talk about these two together. Uh, saying, what do you think Disney's plans are with Coruscant after the announcement of the new shows and movies leading up to episode seven? Also, aside from KOTOR and Empire War, what are your favorite OG Star Wars games from back in the day? I miss playing uh, A New Hope on my Super Nintendo. Thanks, guys. Oh, I hate those Super Star Wars games. They're so hard. Hmm. Um, My favorite games... Uh, I really liked Shadows of the Empire as a kid in the Rogue Squadron game because I had an N64. Um, the Jedi Academy series and Jedi Knight and Dark Forces, they're all great. Um, besides Empire War and Kodor, though, those are up there. Star Wars Squadrons for me is probably my favorite, actually. Yeah, um, but that's but not yeah. really an old game. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but yeah, any any idea what they're going to do with Coruscant, though? I don't really I've got no sweet clue. There. So the idea was... Um, Pablo tweeted about this that the reason Coruscant wasn't touched for a long time was because it was supposed to play prominently in episode 9 um, but yeah <laughs> that didn't happen <laughs> so shown in the hyperspace having, skipping <laughs> yeah so we just ended up having no uh, even in so in in the original version Coruscant was going to be like the scene for most of the battle um, and most of the movie and then even in JJ's version there was a uh, Coruscant like abandoned there's some concept art them going to the Jedi Temple. Um, and yeah, obviously that never happened. Yeah, uh, that would have been really cool. I really yeah. wish we got Trevorrow's episode nine. I just want to see what that would have been. But uh, it would have been so wacky, but it's I prefer wacky than uh, wacky than boring. <laughs> <laughs> Rise of Skywalker. Uh, yeah. But yeah, so games, I think kind of have the similar answer to you there, like the Jedi Academy game or the Jedi Knight games. Uh, I like the original Battlefront. I do not like Battlefront 2 very much. Mm, so that's right. probably where my answers would differ from most. And, you know, I don't think it's that good. Yeah, I mean, I understand your your argument there. I, I, I played a lot of the pod racer game as well. Um, I didn't play the X-Wing games as a kid, but I went back and played X-Wing Alliance and I really liked it a lot. Um, she didn't have a PC back then, but yeah, I think we're in. Lego games are good too. I, I'm kind of looking forward to playing the Clone Wars game again because I remember enjoying that when I played it the first time. But I was also a kid, so I don't know how. You much mean like that's the really... one for Xbox? Uh yeah. I think it was the, the Dark Reaper. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I I, remember, I got that with my Xbox. I remember beating it in one day. Yeah, it's um, really short, but I remember having fun with it. So I kind of want to see if that held up. On that note, the Revenge of the Sith game is actually pretty damn good. Yeah, that's true. I think you could do that in co-op as well. Oh, that would be something to look into. But um, I could be wrong on that, but I think it had that. So we've got, of course, a question from Joel. He says, for this week, I have two questions. How does Revenge of the Sith novel uh, live up to the conclusion of the multimedia 2000s compared to the actual movie? Um, we kind of touched on that a bit. I, like I mentioned that like it's it's pretty there's some references you get most of it with Windu I think yeah. you do get like Alpha's name dropped and we get some stories but I don't think it does a whole lot other than lip service yeah it's it's basically episode three plus a couple references like that which is fine but yeah uh, and then the second question is if Corey and Eck were Dark Lords of the Sith of the Rule of Two what would your names be and more importantly who would be the master and who would be the apprentice um 
I think we'd both be uh, we'd be apprentices under I don't know somebody better at YouTube than us. <laughs> so I still use my force powers to be a better YouTuber. Like, are we kind of like the whole Plagueis and uh, Tenebris or Vectivus? Venomous, Venomous situation yeah. under Tenebris. Yeah, I call Plagueis in that case because. Oh yeah. God damn it! <laughs> I mean, my first online name, or yeah, I think it was my first, was Darth Arbiter. So I guess I just have to bring that back. Can't think of a good name. I think um, it fits. I like to, I like to decide things, right? Yeah. And I also a have a, a jaw that kind of splits four ways. So. I mean, it does half of that at least. Yeah, I don't know. I'm going to have to think about that. Um, MC Raven says in chat, uh, is Charlie the master? No. No. Um, I think mine would be dark. Uh, rate our podcast five stars and your favorite audio podcast provider, including iTunes, Spotify, Podbean, and more. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Is there anything else you want to talk about today, Corey? Uh, the fact that you just called Darth Dark, like some sort of uh, mother of a Star uh, Wars fan. God damn. Podcast canceled. That's not good. No, my dad five always stars. Says, my dad always says uh, CP3O, which is your dad, Charlie? Well, that's what I said last time because Charlie said I was like, "Wow, you're you're an old man." Um, but yeah, I don't know. I mean, let me just check our reviews real quick. Did we get it? Yeah, we here. should. Uh, if you leave a review, if we remember, we'll read it on the show, even if it's a bad review, because we find those kind of entertaining. Please don't yeah. give us a bad review. Give us a good review, unless you don't like the podcast, then give us a bad review. But, Someone uh, said for a couple Canucks, they're pretty awesome. So, I think that was an I older like one. Was it? I don't think there's anything really new. Um, uh, we got this one in March that says that was March of last year. This is a great podcast, guys. I love the deep dive into Star Wars original lore. This feels like I get from the pod. I get this feels I get from the podcast are the same ones you used to get from Force.net or Yivitz or Mr. Bubble when I was in high school. Nice to see some of their keeping OG Star Wars lore. Discussions alive and well. Very nice. All right. Well, I think that's going to do it for us today on Tapcalf Transmissions for episode 66. Our first mm. uh, our first milestone that we've celebrated on the podcast. Didn't celebrate episode 50. Didn't celebrate our anniversaries, even though I think we've had like two by now. Uh, I think we we're didn't always do this. Second one now. Because we, yeah, we, we haven't always done it as a weekly thing, so we can't reliably mm. use the episode number. Mm. Uh, so, yeah, I guess it would have been... Sometime we were bi-weekly for a long time. Yeah. Um, I was looking on Podbean. I can find out right now. Yeah. But uh, I don't know what our next special themed episode would be. Our next episode will be episode or will be next Friday talking about Bad Batch episodes five and six. Uh, we'll, we're going to find out that uh, June 2nd, 2019. Sorry, sorry, we're actually coming up on that. Yeah. Yeah. That will be next Wednesday, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe we'll tweet something, a picture That'll of be two uh, years. Wow. A picture of our first episode. You can go back and listen to that, hear how much it was better than or how much more it sucked than this episode did. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. But yeah, we're going to do another podcast in 24 minutes, though. Yeah. So if you guys want to check out more, uh, X2 will be streaming live with um, our good friend Scalp Waka. He's a very nice, very nice young man. We can drink some beers. Talk Best squadrons shit. player in the world. Best squadrons player in the whole world. Yeah. I think that's going to be it for me. Is that it from you, Corey? That's it for me. All right. Good night, everybody.